So our, our, our next uh, presentation is a team presentation. Uh, so Takjeep oh. and Zhao Wei are going to give a, a talk about, I think, some of the history of, of Steve's lab as well as um, some of their own work. Polymer physics and biophysics. And we decided to do it together because we uh, spent the uh, same period in Steve's lab as postdocs in Stanford University. And uh, not only that, we were actually graduate students of the physics department here in Berkeley at the same time, obtaining the PhD in the same year. So you could call this show uh, Dance of the uh, Positronium. Yeah, right. I guess that's how you pronounce it. So she is the positron and I'm the electron. I'm the more feminine <laughs> of the two. So uh, these, these are the papers that Steve have, uh, has published. No, more uh, than that. Actually, more, more than, than that, important. but in, uh, ordered uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of number of total citations. As you can see, 15 out of 40 uh, papers are on polymer physics and biophysics. Okay, and so the huge impact here. And uh, not, none yet on this list uh, on the energy science. So we want to emphasize the number one cited work, that is the optical treasures uh, invention, uh, published in 1986 in Optics Letters, done together with Art Ashkin. And you heard a wonderful story about this from colleagues' talk uh, just a few minutes ago. It was titled, Observation of Single Beam Gradient Force Optical Trap for Dielectric Particles. And, and in fact, when Steve moved to Stanford, he uh, uh, teamed up with uh, uh, Steve Tron uh, at Stanford University to build uh, his own optical trap there. And he was able to manipulate and uh, measure single DNA molecules. And Steve Tron actually just left, told me that uh, Steve was uh, his uh, best biology student ever in his uh, <laughs> <laughs> entire career. So uh, zooming through many years, uh, perhaps the most exciting de uh, development in this area is the improvement of the resolution uh, of the optical trap to angstrom level. And uh, this was pioneered by Steve from labs, uh, Tom Perkins, who is chairing the session, former student of Steve, and uh, Stephen Block's lab in Stanford University, and also Bustamante's lab here in Berkeley. And notice that the three angstrom resolution you have is actually really the size of the period of the DNA molecule, single base pair. Uh, distance. So once you have that uh, resolution, you can do many different things. For example, Stephen Block showed that you can use that uh, apparatus to actually sequence the DNA because now you have the ability to, to measure the motion of an RNA polymerase moving on the uh, DNA template with a single base pair resolution. Another example that you just heard is from uh, uh, Carlos's lab. Uh, in fact, I, I got this slide from Jan Shemna, uh, his former postdoc that uh, we hired in Illinois uh, in the physics department. And where, you know, once you have this ultimate uh, single base pair resolution, then uh, you can actually discover uh, completely new things that actually uh, challenge uh, the, uh, the models that have been published in the last 20 years. So really, uh, it's a really exciting time to make uh, uh, great discoveries using the techniques that Steve actually pioneered earlier. In his own lab, he uh, used the optical tweezers to play a tug of war uh, uh, with the ribosome. The ribosome, as you know, is a wonderful machine that makes proteins based on the template information contained in the messenger RNA. And here what, uh, okay, here. So what he did was to uh, put a, uh, the ribosome attached to the messenger RNA, and then use the laser trap to uh, pull on it, and then by moving the sample state sideways, you can uh, apply force to the ribosome RNA complex until the bond ruptures. So you can measure the strength of the interaction between the ribosome and the RNA using this method. Very elegant and simple method. And they discovered that uh, a very important interaction called a uh, Shang-Degano interaction uh, between the ribosome and the RNA itself 
uh, breaks only after uh, the bond between the two amino acids have uh, formed, uh, something that you could never actually uh, detect using any other methods. So this was uh, published uh, last year, done by a, a former uh, uh, postdoc uh, who was uh, spending time with Steve uh, in Japan. I couldn't find his photo, so I could. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here? OK, no, he's not here. All right. Right, so, uh, well, another area that optical tweezer made a great impact on, uh, other than the biophysics area, is in the polymer dynamics area, especially when you combine the really powerful ability of using optical tweezer to manipulate things and the powerful ability of uh, video microscopy to observe things, uh, and then you can directly visualize uh, the polymer dynamics in a way that was never imagined before. So these are DNA molecules, and then you grab it with a bead, with optical tweezer, and the uniform flow so that you stretch it. And then when you uh, stop the flow, you can observe the relaxation. And then in this case, the relaxation uh, shows very interesting uh, scaling law according to length. And then also, if you actually put the polymer in a really very concentrated medium or a lot of polymer surrounding it, and then you use the optical tweezer to stretch out the polymer, and then you watch how the polymer relax, and then you found a very interesting thing, and that is uh, they do not collapse isotropically from all directions, and they actually follow the contour of the polymer and relax. And that was the reputation that Tom Perkins has mentioned. And uh, if you think about it, uh, it's not surprising that uh, the fact that you have so many other polymers surrounding this particular one that is relaxing, and then they, they form some confinement that looks like a tube. So when the polymer collapses it, or relaxes, it looks like a snake and then can only uh, rotate around its own contour. And uh, what's uh, really significant is uh, it's a prediction that made by Dejane in 1971, and then more than 20 years later in Steve's lab, that uh, they used a single molecule visualization approach to prove this. And the uh, powerful trail that actually started these uh, polymer dynamics work in Steve's lab, uh, I think they're all here. Uh, uh, Tom Perkins is our chair, and Steve uh, Quake will speak uh, later, and uh, Doug Smith. And uh, you can also, I don't know whether Steve will cover this, uh, so I'll just go through it quickly. If you grab the beads at the two ends and then look at how the polymer dance, and then you found that the polymer looks just like a guitar string or a piano string, that uh, its dancing movement uh, is uh, composed of many independent uh, normal modes. And then you can also look at how polymers sort of extend themselves in a non-uniform flow, which happened to be extremely important uh, even for uh, some important applications uh, these days, a little out of date with Steve talking about alternative energy sources. But in oil pumps, uh, that these polymer extension under non-uniform flow has a lot to do with the smooth transportation of oils, for example, uh, oil pumps. So in the elongation flow, where the flow goes just like these arrows show, and then you can directly visualize how they stretch out. And then you found that these little polymers are just like human beings. They all have individuality. They do not unfold uh, in a similar manner, but there are many uh, different pathways. And then, of course, uh, there are different kinds of the flows uh, that can stretch out polymer. For example, shear flow, mixed flow, and so on. And then here it comes to another really amazing thing. There's this long theory that has been uh, predicted uh, back in the 1974 by Dejane to say that uh, you know, how you stretch out a polymer depends on the strength of the flow, but that's a first order transition because uh, when the polymer is coiled up, the viscous drag is not that strong, and then as it unravels, you see more of that. So it goes nonlinearly, and that gives you this first order transition, and then after all these different flow type of work, 30 years later, finally, after generations of students uh, going by Steve's lab, they narrowed it down that you see this hysteresis of uh, extension versus the strain. And then uh, this one is uh, 30 years later coming to proof of a theoretical 
uh, prediction of, uh, of De Jing, which shows two things, that De Jing has really a foresight, and then the other thing is uh, Steve is very persistent. So, uh, so here I would like to introduce uh, two uh, more recent uh, members who is uh, in this polymer team, Hazen Babcock and Charles Schroeder, who did a lot of this. And then I have some anecdotal stories from Hazen to show you how good an experimentalist uh, Steve is. So when Hazen was building this machine, trying to see the stretching of polymer uh, in a mixed flow, the machine was very sticky, so, so the polymer really just jerked us around. And then, uh, and Steve comes into lab and he said, you know, Hazen, the problem is the machine is very sticky, so you want to fix that. And typical advisors would walk away because I give you the vision already. And Steve made the next suggestion. He said, I think the lead screw, you can use a more superior type. And then he even suggested the type. And then, boom, that solved the problem. And then that's how you can see these uh, beautiful polymer string uh, 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 unraveling movies. And uh, more than that, Steve also has an attention to detail that's really quite amazing if you think about how many things he's involved in. So when Hazen made a talk for Steve, and then Steve said, uh, Hazen, you have this pro quality of making a really exciting piece of result into the most boring presentation ever. So, uh, so he said, uh, look how I'm going to transform that. So he pointed to one figure, and then he changed one black line in the figure into red. And he said, what a world difference uh, that has made. <laughs> so that made the talk more exciting, I guess. So, uh, and then uh, this, is, this is only one aspect of using uh, tweezers and visualization to look at polymer dynamics. Of course, as Carlos has mentioned, there are many polymer mechanics state studies that you can do, how they stretch out under force and how they twist under force, where, uh, where Carlos is an expert in, and that also benefits from the tweezer invention that, uh, that uh, TJ has talked about. And then also you can not only visualize this kind of uh, polymers uh, that simulate their behavior in oil pumps, you can also look at biopolymers and see how they behave in real time with video microscopy in live cell. And here I highlight uh, one of this work, Ben Xiao Cui, I think is also in the audience, uh, that they look at neural growth factor trafficking in live cells. So uh, with that, back to you again, TJ. Yeah, so we heard that in atomic physics, you can observe things passively. You can also manipulate. The same holds for biophysics. So you can use optical trap to manipulate, but you can also use fluorescence to uh, observe uh, single biological molecules uh, one, uh, uh, passively. So when I was a graduate student uh, here in LBL, actually, I was uh, working with Daniel Shemler and Shimon Weiss. So we uh, made the first demonstration that you can measure uh, so-called threat of fluorescence resonance energy transfer at the single molecule level. And this actually can be used to measure the relative movements of two biomolecules uh, through the distance dependent uh, intensity changes of the two different colored flu fluorescent molecules. Or you can also, also measure the internal uh, movements or conformational changes of molecule using this method. Actually, in, in this, uh, now this has become a main, you know, mainstream technology used by many different laboratories. And the, the, in the abstract, we actually wrote that uh, monitoring conformational changes uh, within a single biomolecule may be possible in the future, which I, I didn't uh, actually believe uh, to be the case. Uh, uh, I thought that is what you have to do to get your paper published. But anyway, actually, it actually became a reality uh, in no small part uh, to the things that have actually happened uh, since in uh, Steve's laboratory. So uh, in Steve's lab, we uh, found a very simple model system uh, called a small RNA-3 junction, which was known to uh, fold into a more compact structure when a protein binds or when you add uh, magnesium ions. So we demonstrate using this model system that, yes, in fact, uh, FRET can be used to measure the conformational uh, dynamics of a single molecule uh, and uh, in, in fact, uh, we, uh, because the dynamics was too fast, what we decided to do is to use a flow system to uh, change the solution condition between no magnesium and uh, uh, magnesium condition back and forth to actually uh, cause the conformational change and to detect the conformational changes uh, in real time. 
So uh, that uh, leads to the next uh, right. slide. Right, so uh, as uh, TJ said, you can not only see the conformational dynamics of, uh, of biomolecules by, uh, in the induced version, you can also see these uh, structural conformational dynamics happen in spontaneously in real time. And here using FRET, uh, we can see the folding unfolding of this little hairpin ribozyme molecule. And then you can see these, uh, these uh, figures almost look like uh, the telegraph uh, noise kind of figures, which was very pleasing to see. And you can not only see that, you can also see how a, almost like a spaghetti type of biopolymer when it's made, how they collapse spontaneously into a functional three-dimensional shape. And here we use a ribosome to study that. And then you can see in the FRET case, because FRET, FRET monitor the distance between the two, so it also indicates the shape of the molecule. We can see it's unfolded, we, uh, it's folded, we unfolded, and then see how the FRET goes up in real time, and then find that this molecule, uh, not unlike the polymer that, pol uh, that Steve has shown before, is also having individuality uh, and then uh, folded in many different paths. And then I want to give you a more I don't know whether the lights can go down a little bit. I want to give you a more sort of visual demonstration of uh, how fun this is. So here is a bunch of molecules uh, that start mostly folded. And then the, the red and the green indicate the false color to tell you how high FRET is. I think that's the wrong direction. So, uh, so then uh, when we add the unfolding buffer, you see they all go to a low FRET green situation and then uh, then when you add the, back, the folding buffer, and then you can see each individual molecule is coming back to the folded state. That really had a lot of uh, influence uh, in, in my own scientific career that I said, wow, this is so cool. I can just see how things happen. So uh, m many of my later on experiments followed this path. And then I should say that this kind of uh, experiment of frets, it can not only be applied to relatively simple biopolymers, and here I'm showing you a heroic experiment that was done in Steve's lab, applying this fret approach to a really humongous biopolymer that uh, TJ already mentioned, the ribosome that is used to make all the proteins. Uh, and we are existing partly because of this molecule, and tell you how heroic it is. Uh, it, it has a three large RNAs and more than 50 proteins put together into this. And with FRET, they were able to figure out some of the more very important functional aspect. Uh, for example, how is uh, this machine can faithfully translate our genetic code into a protein sequence that performs its function. And then uh, since it's heroic, of course, uh, it has to really cost many students uh, to do that. So Scott Blanchard. Uh, Ruben Gonzalez, uh, Harold Kim, and Taihi Lee. Uh, I think many of them are also in the audience uh, here. So back to you, TJ. Okay. So actually, I have an, an, an anecdotal. Oh, you have an anecdotal. Yes. <laughs> so in, in two, year 2000, I accepted a position at Illinois. But Steve came to my office. TJ, we are going to start to work on the ribosome. Why do you need to leave? You <laughs> stay and then you can do the ribosome. So, uh, well, I got uh, my tenure before these papers are published. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see how heroic this experiment actually uh, was. So uh, another system that uh, Steve has studied very extensively is uh, protein uh, core snares. And these are the proteins that cause membrane to fuse, uh, for example, in, uh, in neurons when the neurons fire okay, to release neurotransmitters. And uh, Keith Veninger uh, was a key person here to study this process by labeling the snare proteins using fluorescent molecules and uh, to study what happens to them during the fusion and their, uh, their uh, dynamic uh, properties. And one uh, uh, result that I want to just mention is that uh, they actually found that most of the snare proteins actually form complexes that are uh, anti-parallel. Okay? Uh, in the single molecule experiments, while the uh, crystal, uh, crystal, uh, crystal structural studies done by uh, Axel Brunker uh, uh, show only the parallel structures. So somehow, if you don't have the crystal line uh, constraints, then you do get uh, these undesired uh, complexes. And in fact, they use uh, uh, 
uh, detergent uh, denaturing uh, conditions to purify uh, the more stable complexes and found that actually they are actually mostly uh, parallel, suggesting that, that uh, uh, you do get this uh, metastable stage uh, in, in trapped kinetically, but it means that uh, in nature there must be some other uh, accessory proteins that actually uh, 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 chaperon them into the properly uh, uh, assembled uh, structure. I think you continue. I continue, okay. <laughs> um, so then I want to spend a, a few minutes to uh, talk about two things that uh, I did in, in my lab, but heavily influenced by uh, Steve's. So this is uh, 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 another Nobel Prize winning uh, achievement by Watson and Crick to propose a structure of the double helical DNA. But that paper ended with this sentence saying that, well, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing suggests a possible copying mechanism for DNA, uh, generating material. And then actually, uh, uh, people actually thought this is like the understatement of the century. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they uh, worried that uh, they published another paper in Nature the next month, proposing this base pairing in a very explicit manner. So you can see that in, that in, in, in those days, it was uh, pretty quick to publish in this journal. Uh, s s and, but this paper also ended with another sentence saying that, well, if, even if this is correct, there are many things to, to uncover. For example, how do you actually separate the two chains that are, are highly uh, stable? Okay? And uh, about 30 years ago, people discovered that there are actually enzymes in the cell that are called helicases that actually unwind and separate the DNA into two strands using ATP. So uh, I wanted to study this in Steve's lab, but uh, I encountered a major problem. The surface that we were using to study RNA molecules were, were not, was not good enough. Proteins were sticking to the surface like crazy. So that was, there was a few months period there I was really uh, depressed. And Steve uh, told me that, well, you have to fix it. You, know, you, have, you should have no inhibition about you know, using chemistry to fix whatever problem you have. So he took my hands and then he, you know, you know, we visited uh, some chemistry laboratories in Stanford University and you know, got a good suggestion. We actually found a method to use polymer brush to coat the surface to reject the sticking of the proteins to the surface. And then that's when I, re when I realized that, well, OK, now you can study larger protein DNA interactions, and it's time to m open my own shop. Okay? So, so we, uh, we began this uh, helicase study. The idea was to use the fluorescent labeling of the DNA molecule. And as a, he as a helicase unzips the DNA, the distance between the two dyes will uh, increase, and thereby uh, you get the reduction in tr energy transfer between the two, uh, two molecules. And we did some initial experiments uh, that, uh, published, that was published uh, uh, some years ago. And then if the, but the really, the, the goal was to measure the step size of unwinding by the helicases. And it took uh, many more years to actually, to actually get to that point and we are able to actually measure uh, stepwise unwinding of the DNA by uh, a helicase. And that was uh, 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 shown to be about three base pairs uh, per step, and uh, consistent with the data published by uh, the Carlos's lab. But the, the surprising part was that if you actually look at the dual times of the individual uh, step, it was not uh, uh, exponential. Actually, you, you see a lag phase and a decay, uh, suggesting that there are about three hidden steps per uh, dual. And we now propose that the most fundamental step of a helicase uh, catalyzed DNA unwinding is a uh, step of one base pair per ATP. But uh, uh, you need to actually have uh, some accumulated uh, tension. Oh, this really doesn't work, OK? Um, so that uh, you actually move on the DNA uh, three steps of single base pair until you actually re you release the energy accumulated to unwind uh, three, three base pairs in a, in a burst, which is actually, uh, uh, you know, to me, it's quite similar to what uh, Carlos presented as a, the cooperative mechanism of packaging of DNA by the virus. And another thing that we did was to uh, uh, combine the fluorescence with optical tweezers. Here, the goal is to actually now you want to manipulate and observe at the same time. And uh, in fact, I went to Steve's lab to learn optical tweezers, but I never had a chance to learn it. Uh, so I still had this uh, uh, envy uh, 
force envy. And uh, so we wanted to measure the conformational changes via fluorescence as a function of applied uh, force or tension. And uh, many years of efforts eventually led to uh, this experiment where you look at a uh, uh, non-canonical DNA structure made of four strands of DNA that is known to fluctuate between the two states. And uh, then we can uh, ask ourselves what happens if you apply tension? Can you bias the transitions between the two states uh, using, using the force? And in fact, the answer is yes. You can actually uh, increase the force, and you can bias the transition to one state. And by repeating these measurements for different constructs and different uh, uh, pooling configurations, we were able to deduce the structure of the transition state uh, that uh, lies between the two uh, stable structures. And in fact, that looks very much like the structure of this same DNA bound to uh, its natural uh, uh, partner, uh, you know, protein that uh, binds and processes this uh, particular molecule. So is it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. oh, so okay. okay. <laughs> so this is an advertisement. So, uh, <laughs> so in Illinois, we have a really strong group of uh, single molecule biophysics people who are doing experiments and computational work. And uh, we really were not really satisfied with the rate of progress in terms of technical developments. So we teamed up to propose uh, a center uh, for the physics of living cells. And uh, it was uh, just uh, funded by the, the NSF as one of the physics frontiers centers. And what uh, I really feel uh, uh, that we owe to Steve here is that uh, because Steve does uh, all this single molecule biophysics work, people now think that it's OK to do that in the physics department. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's now it's, it's considered physics, so uh, of course it's a frontier, so you can get funded by NSF for, for doing, doing this. If you, have so, if you have some good students, we have some positions. All right, so uh, uh, I will also talk a little bit of work in my own lab. We, of course, also continue FRET work and study the assembly of biomachinery and uh, how they function and so on. But I thought uh, maybe we have... Uh, talked enough about FRET, so uh, I'm going to now uh, give you a new direction of uh, single molecule uh, detection and imaging, and that has to do with uh, how to boost uh, the resolution of uh, an optical microscopy using single molecule detection. So we all know that uh, light microscopy has really made significant impact in many areas, especially in biology, but there's one sort of nagging, annoying thing about light microscopy is uh, light is a wave and it diffracts. So, so when you try to visualize small things, uh, you have this diffraction limit. So that thing smaller than a few hundred nanometers uh, looks like a blur and you cannot see it. But uh, in single molecule detection, it has been a non-known fact that even though a image of a single molecule looks blurry, it nonetheless does not stop you from determining the very center of, uh, of it and then tell you the precisely the position of the molecule. And then we thought uh, maybe we could uh, use that to convert that into a super resolution imaging method. But the problem is, of course, when you have many of them overlapping, how do you distinguish them? So we have this idea. So if you have uh, some fluorescent molecules, uh, that can photo switch. Say here is a full of fluorophores, but they're not, they're, they're not fluorescent, they're dark. And then I come in with a light that can switch them into a fluorescent state, but only a small subset, so that you can see their individual positions, and then you can localize them, and then you turn them off, and then you activate another subset that are not overlapping, and then you determine their positions, and then eventually you do enough times, you get a very high resolution image. Just like here, you have a blurry image, but if you activate a small subset and determine the position of it, then you can see uh, a much sharper image. So uh, we uh, call this uh, stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy, in short name, STORM. And then uh, also this method, uh, I, I would like to say that it's actually simultaneously invented by three labs. So our lab and Eric Betzik's lab at Gelinia Farm and Samuel Haas lab at uh, at uh, University of Maine. So the rest this is just some slideshow to show you what kind of uh, resolution that we have and uh, how does that change imaging. For example, here is a microtubule structure 
inside the cell. And these are the things that give the cell sort of uh, its shape, and then many motors move on it to, to transport cargoes. And this is a conventional light microscopy image. And this is uh, what you can see with a storm image. And then if you put them side by side, you see these individual tracks so where motors move on that cannot be resolved in a light mic uh, conventional light microscopy. Now you can clearly see them. And then you can do it in a multi-color fashion because we actually discovered a family of uh, photoswitchable fluorophores that has many different colors. So here is microtubule and clustering coated pit. Good, this is not storm image. This is conventional image. That's why it's uh, blurry. But uh, if you compare that with a storm image, and then you can see the sharp contrast where things resolve. And then you can even begin to see the shape of these tiny little machinery called clustering coated pits that are uh, used for cell to take up its nutrients. And then you can not only do that in a 2D manner, you can also do that in a 3D manner because uh, when we do light microscopy, we know that when you get out of focus, the shape of the molecule change, it gets uh, bigger. And so with that, uh, what essentially was that we add astigmatism, then you can start to see 3D. Here is a movie playing that we, if we slice through Z, then you can see this diffraction emitted spot is actually a spherical shell. So you can really appreciate the kind of uh, uh, difference uh, in terms of uh, resolution between storm and conventional light microscope. So I would like to uh, sort of conclude this part by quoting a very, I mean, one of Steve's most favorite quotes. You know, I hear him saying that a lot. and that that I, I thought he was very wise, he can come up with that thing. But later on, he told me it came from this bo baseball player, Yugi Berra. So one can observe a lot by just watching. So these uh, single molecule techniques uh, that uh, TJ and I covered today hopefully serve that role, and, and Carlos, uh, and then Steve Quake later on, serve that role of uh, inventing these new methods that allow us uh, to watch and observe uh, the microscopic world of life uh, in a much more crispier way. So was that, oh, okay. we have something okay, fun so, at the so end. I, so we are done with the science part. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I want to actually dispel uh, a myth that uh, was propagating. So when I moved to Illinois, uh, we, we finally made enough money to have a second child. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so I na we named him uh, uh, Stephen, okay? And then uh, uh, the people in the Chu lab told me that they think that I named him after Stephen Chu, which I may have done it subconsciously, but no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the sound of the name. Uh, in fact, it, it doesn't spell in the same way. Uh, so, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, he was playing with uh, the pillow that shows uh, and has a picture, a picture of a pocky monster character called uh, Pikachu. So my wife uh, told him that you look just like a Pikachu, and that's actually Pikachu. What he said was that, no, I'm not a Pikachu. I am Steven Chu. <laughs> <laughs> So here I present uh, Stephen Chu. <laughs> you, you continue. No, 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 you know, it was a, I, I was completely surprised. Some, actually, uh, someone told me about this, uh, at Hazen's uncle, uh, at a meeting. Uh, he didn't know that he was not supposed to tell us. So I thought, oh, maybe I'm the, I'm the only one who doesn't know about this. So I met Steve uh, in the next meeting. So I, I, I talked to Steve. He was distracted as usual. But I asked uh, Steve, did you hear that Hazen is getting married? And Steve said, how come I'm the, only, the last one to hear about these things? So, <laughs> So I learned, I so I, like, okay, he doesn't know, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not the only one. And we actually celebrated his 50th birthday party uh, when we were in Stanford uh, together. And in fact, many of the people are uh, here. And actually, two years ago, uh, I realized that uh, you know, Steve must be becoming 60 you know, in 2008. 
So we actually asked Steve, you know, is, if it's okay to organize a celebration for him, and he didn't say no. So I guess that means we, we, we could do it. So that's why I uh, put it together. So uh, back to a more serious note, we just wanted to show you a kind of impact that Steve made in because he's so famous an atomic physicist. Actually, I have another anecdotal. I was on the on the on the car on a bus, and then we were talking about Steve. Uh, and then I said, uh, Steve got his Nobel Prize uh, in atomic physics, and then people know about his biophysics work and said. Steve also does atomic physics. <laughs> so, but anyway, so here I try to list the Steve's uh, uh, children that actually made it to uh, professor academic positions. And then if I missed any of them, I apologize. And you can come and tell us later. But I would like to say that this didn't come at no cost. Because uh, this is what Steve looked like when he joined Stanford in 19, back in 19. Can I have the lights down? so that you can see the very young, innocent, sort of uh, <laughs> naive look at Steve. Uh, and, and this is what he looked now. And obviously, we consumed him a lot. But uh, hopefully, with the hair gets grayer, and we think that Steve also inevitably got wiser and more sophisticated. And an evidence to show that uh, is now he can actually get the years <laughs> of these uh, very important politician. We think that might be a good thing because he might really be able to convince them of alternative uh, sustainable energy sources and then solve the, uh, solve the uh, energy crisis uh, for our next generation. And I, of course, so you can see I get this picture from the website. And these days, you can get many things from the website. So when I was actually searching pictures, images of Steve True, I also came up with these two, which uh, I was really puzzled what they are. And then eventually, why are they related to Steve True? And then eventually, I came up with a reason, because uh, Steve always has an uh, inquisitive mind and a young heart. So we hope that uh, you will keep these uh, forever. So with that, uh, we will wish you a happy birthday, Steve. We have time for one or two questions. Right, so that's a question that requires no answer because of Bill Phillips' answer himself, you know. <laughs> it, it doesn't come at no cost, you're saying exactly right, because it gives you exquisite spatial resolution at a cost of how fast you can take the images. But I would like to say that things are very optimistic because now we already have you know, images of dynamic images of live cells uh, also with very high resolution and with uh, you know uh, the push of instrument limit. Uh, you know, Steve uh, does that his whole lifetime. So these people would make faster cameras and stuff like that. So we do think that the speed will also catch up to allow you to study many many live processes uh, in in live cells.
No, that's microtubules that are made of many tubulin molecules. So we are labeling those tubulin molecules to allow you to see that string. It's along the whole length. Okay, so let's thank the speakers for a wonderful presentation.